All right. Hi, everybody. It's John here with my friend Ashley from the Kansas City Zoo. Today, we're going to talk about how we classify animals using this big word called phylogenetics. So first off, let's talk about what classification is. Essentially, classification is how uh, scientists and zookeepers group animals. They look at things that are very similar about a group of animals. They put them all together. So without further ado, let's kind of look at that phylogenetics thing. Ashley. What is phylogenetics? Well, first off, you made classification sound pretty simple. So classification, the definition itself, grouping and sorting, that's pretty simple. But when it comes to classification for animals, it gets complicated rather quickly. Now, the reason why scientists use classification is it's an amazing tool to make sense of the animal kingdom. Scientists think that there's about 1.5 million different animal species. So they start to group and sort them based off of characteristics. Now, other scientists also believe that there's eight to 10 million animals that are yet to be discovered. So classification also becomes a tool to make sense of the animals that are yet to be discovered. And as John mentioned, there are a couple tools that we can use. So first off, some of these terms might seem familiar to you. Now, if classification may sound new, you might hear us use certain phrases around the zoo like this animal is related to another. For example, we might say that a rock hyrax is the closest living animal relative to the elephant. That is classification. But these terms here are ways that we can uh, kind of narrow down an animal species. So we start off very broad with kingdom, and then as we go down further, we get a little bit more specific. So kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Now I know for myself, every biology teacher I ever had had their own special way to remember the order of these terms, but my favorite way to remember them was keep ponds clean or frogs get sick. And that helps us remember the order of what we call our taxonomic terms. Now the big classification tool that we're gonna be using today is something called a phylogenetic tree. Now I love phylogenetic trees because there's just so much information that you can include on them. So first off, we have a really big branch here. That's our main branch for our tree. And then as we have these um, branches off, that's when we get into our different phylums. So our kingdom today that we're talking about is Animalia, obviously. Animal kingdom. <laughs> Animal kingdom. And then up here are gonna be different phylums. Now, like I said, classification is this really big scientific idea. It gets complicated very quickly. Scientists think, well, it depends on what scientists you ask, but there's somewhere around 36 different phylum. For today, we're only gonna be talking about five, and we're only gonna be talking about just the bare basics of them, just to give you an idea of how classification works and the tools that scientists use. So we'll go ahead and get started, because I think once we get started here, it'll all start to come together. So all of these hash marks are characteristics. As we start to group and sort animals, we have to provide a reason why we're putting them in that specific group. And the reason why are those characteristics. So we'll start off here and we'll just give a couple characteristics to what makes an animal an animal. So down here, I'm gonna write movement and consumer. Now that it's written on our board, those two characteristics are gonna be true for anything else that we're gonna put on our phylogenetic tree here. So as an animal, it has to move and it has to consume. It has to bring in energy. And for our very first phylum we're gonna talk about is Porifera. Now today we are gonna be giving you the scientific terms a lot of scientists prefer to use Latin because it is a dead language. It doesn't change over time, which means no matter which scientist is using characteristics or classification, no matter where they are around the world, they're speaking a common language. So for periphera, the characteristics that we're just gonna be giving this uh, phylum is asymmetry, and no 
tissues. So an example of an animal that would be included in periphera are sea sponges. So sea sponges themselves are actually an animal. They satisfy both of our main characteristics here. They are a consumer because they are filter feeders. They draw the water in through their pores and bring in the food. And then they actually do move. Now for movement here, they do kind of rest and stick themselves to the ocean floor, but they do have a larval state that does move throughout the ocean. So even though they may not move throughout their entire life cycle, during one portion of their life cycle, they do move. So they do still satisfy our movement characteristic. Now for the ones that are special to periphera, they have no tissues. Now they do have cells, but their cells are designed to be specialized for different functions. There's cells for feeding, there's cells for defense, but those cells are not acting in any sort of coordinated manner, so no tissues. And then the other um, characteristics we're gonna give periphera is asymmetry. So asymmetry actually means that they lack symmetry. No matter which way I rotate or move a sea sponge, there's no way where I can cut it in half and get two identical halves or portions of this sea sponge. So you'll notice that very early on within our phylogenetic tree, our animals are very, very simple. We haven't given them a whole lot of characteristics to satisfy, and usually we talk about what they lack more so than what they have. So we'll go ahead and keep moving. Yep. We'll go on to our next one. So now, for everything else in our tree, we're gonna say that our phylums do have tissues, and they are going to have symmetry. And our next group we're going to talk about is nadarias. So nadarias are things like jellyfish and corals. So what characteristics are we going to give jellyfish by looking at them? Well, they do have symmetry, but here we're going to have to define what type of symmetry they have. They have radial symmetry. So radial symmetry is a type of symmetry where if you look at just the tops of the jellyfish, you can split them in multiple different ways where they have multiple different lines of symmetry. So I always think of radial symmetry as radius. Radius is a mathematical term to describe a point between the center of a circle out to the circumference. So kind of like a pizza pie, you can divide that in multiple different ways and still see that symmetry. And then the second characteristics that we can give cnidarians is stinging cells. And then the other group as mentioned within cnidaria is corals. So this right here is an example of a coral taken from the ocean. And what you notice is the structure itself is not radial symmetry, but a coral is um, a bunch of different coral animals together, and together they create that structure. So if we were to break it down into the individual animals, they would still experience radial symmetry. All right, so hopefully we're giving you some idea of classification and how to use this, but John, I think you have an animal to help us discuss the next phylum. I do, so you can kind of see in between those two phylums there is one other characteristic. And what kind of happens from here on out, all of our animals that we're going to see start having what we call bilateral symmetry, which means if you were to split them right down the middle, they're the same on both sides. One of those animals that I have to illustrate is one of our ambassador animals, our rosy tarantula. She belongs to that next phylum, which is arthropods or arthropoda. So arthropoda gets a little bit interesting. There's a bit of an offshoot that we'll talk about here in a minute, but tarantulas are in that group. One of the things that they are known for is they do have an exoskeleton. Actually, before we get to that, I just thought of another one. Um, they start to actually have systems as well. So you started seeing those tissues kind of coming together. Then you started seeing specialized cells. With arthropoda, you finally start to see those systems kind of grouping together. You get things like a circulatory system. Uh, things like that are starting to come together as well. But that exoskeleton, what is a skeleton? We have a skeleton, but is ours on the inside or the outside of our bodies, Ashley? 
Ours would be on the inside. Ours would be on the inside. That's way down the line. So an exoskeleton is kind of that hard outer covering. It helps protect all their internal organs, stuff like that. But the other thing is, with an exoskeleton, as a tarantula or as an arthropod grows, their exoskeleton does not. So they have to kind of figure out a way to get rid of it. And that's where her other specialized thing comes in, and it's called molting. So what happens is, part of that skeleton, as it stretches, it'll crack, and she can actually crawl out of her old exoskeleton, and she'll have a kind of a softer one underneath, and she kind of puffs up and expands as much as she can, and it'll harden really, really quickly. And as that hardens again, that gives her room to grow. Now, with arthropods, this is where you also kind of see, if you look at our, our tree so far, a lot of the stuff has been in the ocean. Mm -hmm. Arthropods, you see some are in the water, but then you also see some that are starting to be on land. This is actually the largest phylum out of all the life that we know of on Earth. About, what, 84%, give mm -hmm. or take, of the species that we know of are in that arthropoda group. So I'm going to put her back, let her kind of hang out in her house for right now, because we're going to talk about there's a little bitty offshoot of arthropoda called mollusca. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we call those mollusks. The big difference there is mollusks, they don't molt. They have a shell. We call it a true shell. So I have a couple examples. We have a mussel right here. Mussels don't ever leave their shells, but as they get older, it grows with them. So when they're younger, obviously, it's a lot smaller. Another one I have, you can see all the different chambers. This one, that little tiny pinhole down there, that's where they started when they were very, very, very young. But you can see as they grow, the shell grows with them. So that's one big kind of offshoot in between the two of those. And I think we have one thing left. We already talked about it. Instead of having that exoskeleton, after this phylum, we kind of move into a different one. Mm -hmm. And they have an endoskeleton, which is what we have. So you have it in, your bones are on the inside of your body. Our structure is on the inside, and it grows with us as we grow up. Mm -hmm. So exactly. So our very last phylum that we're going to put on here is chordata and they have an endoskeleton. Now, classification, like I said, is this big, huge scientific idea, so we're actually gonna do a part two to this video to discuss chordata a little bit more in depth, but with an exoskeleton, what we see is that once that structure moves inside to the body, we get bigger animals, bigger animals and we get more complex animals. So I hope this kind of gives you an idea of classification and some of the tools used to make sense of this large animal kingdom. So again, as we move up in our phylogenetic tree, we just get more complicated and complex animals. Yeah. So we are going to do a part two to this video. So make sure you look for that one. Yeah. But for now, I think it's John and Ashley. <laughs> we'll have to say goodbye for now. But thanks for watching, and we'll see you for part two.